Tanya Munro. Professor Tanya Munro made history in January this year after being appointed Australia's new Chief Defence Scientist, the first woman to hold the role. She'll be starting in the role next week, so we're very lucky to have caught her at this very uh, busy time, no doubt, for her. Tanya has an illustrious career to date. As the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President of Research and Innovation at the University of South Australia, she has delivered significant organisational trans transformation and positive cultural change. In 2012, she became one of the youngest living fellows of the Australian Academy of Science, elected for exceptional scientific contributions of international significance to optical glass materials and fibres, photonics and optical physics, most notably in nanophotonics for nonlinear optics and sensing. Professor Munro has worked in both significant national and international roles while working on various boards and committees, including the Prime Minister's Science Council. And in 2017, she marked International Women's Day with a personal donation of $80,000 over two years to assist women managing research commitments and a new baby. She is an alumna of the National Youth Science Forum, having been sponsored by a Rotary Club while in high school. Among other things, Tanya also, because you know she's not busy enough, plays the cello in the Burnside Symphony Orchestra. She has three children, all boys, and 12-year-old twins. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Professor Tanya Munro. Thank you, Heidi, for that lovely introduction, and it's lovely to see so many people here today. Thank you for coming. It's wonderful to hear the depth of Rotary's commitment to diversity within Rotary. And just looking around the room today, I can see how that's coming into effect here in South Australia. I've been asked to share with you a bit of a reflection on my own journey to date and my career as a physicist and um, my experiences along the way. And I have to start by saying that when I hear myself introduced by that, I wonder, I wonder whether to a young woman listening, you might think, ah, oh, could I do that? And if I have a single message today is that a career in science is just an opportunity to stay a child in the best sense of the world, to continue to play to ask questions, to try and find answers, to work with other amazing people. And I'm quite passionate about trying to shed the image that science has of being hard. Because to do anything well in this life requires work, requires effort, requires you to be able to fail, dust yourself off and get back up again. And I think too many people that could make such a contribution to our nation and our world through science. And when I say science, I'm being inclusive to include maths and engineering and medicine, all of these fields that use evidence and data to help us build knowledge and drive change. So for you to understand my story, um, I'm going to start by doing one of the things I was asked to do, which was to explain my own field. So I'm a physicist, and the particular branch of physics in which I've specialised is photonics. I was so pleased to hear in my introduction um, that it was not introduced as phototonics, which is what I typically get. <laughs> so thank you for that, Heidi. Um, photonics, quite simply, is just the science of light. It's around the science and technology of generating photons, photons being the fundamental particle of light, how do we generate them? How do we make a new laser? What do the photons do as they travel through the vacuum of space or through the atmosphere or through a material? How can we use photons to tell us about the world around us? I didn't know when I was a child this was my calling. I was very fortunate to stumble into a love of physics by 
Well, it's a funny story, actually, and I'll share it briefly with you. Music is in my blood, and I played the cello and the piano from a young age. My mother played the cello when she was a girl. Her mother wanted to play the cello. And it was at about age 10 or 11 that I saw that you could apply to go to the Conservatorium High School in Sydney. And so I asked my mother, could I apply to go to the Conservatorium High School? Because I thought of all the music I could do. And she, being a very diligent person, did the research and found out that at the Conservatorium High School, they had an exemption from teaching science. And she said, no, I could not go because it was far too young to cut down my options. I was devastated. I think I cried for a week. But gosh, I'm grateful. <laughs> I... Then a couple of years later, she saw an ad in the newspaper that said music scholarships available at a very good girls' school in Sydney and asked me, would I like to go along and try out? And I did. And it was very funny because I played the piano. They looked down at my rather long feet and said, how would you like to play the pipe organ? And lo and behold, I was the pipe organ scholar at Skeggs Darlinghurst, and for four years I played this enormous beast in every chapel service. Now, why is this important to my story? This is important to my story because music, and specifically the pipe organ, helped to transform me from being a very shy and quiet and rather introverted teenager who'd always loved maths to being someone who could stand in front of you, talk at scientific conferences, and lead. And the other serendipity that came with this was that at that school, I had an extraordinary physics teacher. And I could suddenly see how maths, which had always been a joy for me, but almost a joy in isolation, a plaything, was the language of the universe. And I was riveted by some of the really big questions in astrophysics and cosmology and would use all the money I earned teaching the piano to go down to the bookshop and buy books by some of the popular science writers to try and see what I could learn. I credit Rotary with doing something that was quite profound and transformative for me by supporting me to go to the National Youth Science Forum, or as it was then, the National Science Summer School. When I went to Canberra between year 11 and 12 and met the few hundred other young people who'd been through this rigorous selection process, I had a sudden realisation that I was meeting my own tribe, my own kind, I'd, while I'd had good friends at school, they were so different from me. And I finally could see other people who got excited by things I did. It was suddenly not at all difficult to persuade swathes of people to go down to the bookshop and buy Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. People were listening. <laughs> and following on from that, I had the confidence to follow my dream and go on to study science and maths at the University of Sydney, where I then did a PhD. And it was at the University of Sydney that I decided discovered photonics. And for me, it was discovering photonics that made me understand something that's been important to me ever since, which is that science is at its heart a creative endeavour. The best scientists are not the ones who are best at doing the science. The best scientists are the ones who are best at asking questions. And if you ask exciting questions, you inspire people to come with you to work together because today big questions in science can't be tackled alone. It was creative because you could predict new things about what would light do in a certain circumstance. You could model them on a computer but then you could make a device with your hands and see if it worked. It wasn't until a few years later when I, as a freshly minted PhD, went to the UK to work at an extraordinary research centre at the University of Southampton, where I could see that my love of designing, modelling and making new kinds of photonic devices had a very practical use. It was rare for me to go through a week there where I didn't have someone from industry, someone from defence or government come into my lab and we'd strike up a conversation. And the conversations would usually be, what if, why not, how could we do the following? And there's nothing more empowering, energising than realising that 
you can try something new that can allow a problem to be solved in an entirely new way. So just to give you a taste of some of the things that we were doing there, I was part of a team that working with DARPA, which is a big defense research agency in the, in the US, developed the first larger than one kilowatt fiber laser developed fiber communication systems that could be used for space communications, developed some really new kinds of optical fibers that could allow you to employ essentially any material on the periodic table. Do you know it's the year of the periodic table? I thought you needed to know that. Um, almost what you might not realize is that huge numbers of different materials can be made into a glass. But if you look at the optical fibres that are used for the telecommunication systems we have today, every time you do a Google search, you send photons scurrying across optical fibres. But those fibres are all made of just silicon and oxygen. Okay? Silica glass. And it's great for sending information hundreds and thousands of kilometres. But it, there's things it can't do. And if we could turn other types of glass into optical fibres, we can access a much bigger range of the spectrum, for example. So that's the field that I started working in. And what had originally started as a two- to three-year jaunt in the UK to try and build experience and in international networks became a longer-term commitment. And my husband and I, who I met at First Year University... Um, had settled down, bought a house, had our first child, when I was approached by the Defence Science and Technology Organisation, the University of Adelaide and the state government to start up a photonics research centre here in South Australia. And I did that for 10 amazing years. Um, have any of you seen the wonderful Bragg's building on the North Terrace campus of the university? Yeah, so the majority of people are nodding. That was the best grant I ever wrote. <laughs> we were funded from the federal government during the global financial crisis to set up that building. And it really was the culmination of a vision that had come in a number of stages, um, which I'll share briefly with you. I'd been doing quite a lot of deep thinking about how disciplines, different fields of science work, as I said, I'm a physicist, I'm in the field of photonics, but within the field of photonics, there's many different flavours, specialisations. Now, you can go to a conference with people in your specialisation and you speak a language that nobody else speaks. You know, I could tell you that I've flattened the dispersion of this fibre for 400 nanometers, and if you're in my field, you'll go, great. And if you're not, you'll go, huh? So... I'd, because I'd started working with material science and trying to bring that into new kinds of optical fibres, I'd been starting to broaden out and I'd learnt that to work with people from different fields, you have to learn different languages. I'd also started to realise that all flavours of physics, whether it's cosmology, astrophysics, looking at subatomic particles, laser physics... Actually, there's one thing that unites physicists and distinguishes us from all other types of science. And I've had yet to have anyone give me a counterexample, so if you've got one, please do, because I love being challenged. Um, all flavours of physics are about extending our ability to measure. We want to measure deeper into the cosmos. We want to measure at finer resolutions. We want to measure time more precisely. It's all about extending the limits of measurement. In my own work, a lot of it was about using photons to make measurements within the human body or deep in the Earth's crust. And what I realised was that most other areas of science are utterly beholden to measurement technologies. You ask a biologist, a medical scientist, a geologist what drives them, what excites them, and quite often the answer will boil down to if I can be the first to get my hands on this new piece of equipment, which might be a mass spectrometer, a synchrotron, a telescope, I can you know, get the nature paper because I can be the first to ask this question or get this new data. And I realised that if you could bring those two types of people together, those that get a, a real kick out of measuring new things and those that need to be able to measure new things to ask new questions, 
you could do something profound. And one thing led to another, and that fabulous building there is a testament to that vision because what it does is it brings together everything from applied mathematics, material science, optical physics, surface chemistry, biology, into an integrated suite of laboratories that allow you to do new things. So just as an example, one of the devices I was involved in developing was a new sensor for viruses to be able to quickly make a measurement of things like norovirus. Now, my three boys are all at a school where one in ten boys are out sick at the moment with gastro. You could do with that device there, right? <laughs> now, I'm hoping it's none of them. <laughs> um, now, if you develop a device like that in a physics lab, you can't bring the virus into the lab because it's not equipped to safely handle that chemical, you know, the biological samples. But if you're developing a device as a prototype, it'll have, you know, numerous power cords and, and things that look like grown-ups Lego, essentially, on a big optical table. And you can't take that into a biology lab for similar reasons. So what we did was set up labs where you could do the research in the physics and the biology at the same time. And just to give you a tiny, tiny taste of um, some of the research that my teams have been involved in, I just want to tell you a story that really, to me, dispels the commonly held belief around pure applied sciences. There is this belief that fantastically bright people sit in their ivory towers, have ideas, think of new things, and then some proportion of those things get used and make a difference. And you can reconstruct history to make that seem so through wonderful stories like that of the Braggs here in Adelaide 100 years ago. But my experience is that if you work on really tough practical problems with good people, you tend to serendipitously discover extraordinary things and that things can push back from the applied requirement right back through to new fundamental discovery. So the brief story I share with you is that Working with DST, which is the new organisation that from next week I'm the CEO of, so it's a nice story from a personal narrative arc, one of the first problems they gave me was could we develop an optical fibre that could be embedded within the structure of an aircraft to monitor whether it's corroding? It's really simple. It solves a, conceptually, not practically. <laughs> It's um, really important because the amount of time our planes are out of the sky because of preventative maintenance that may not need to be done. If you could have a way of looking at the structural health of a bridge or an aircraft, it can have a profound practical and economic benefit and safety benefit. Now, moving along the path to try and even get a prototype that could be shown as or off took more than a decade and numerous patents, discoveries, papers, numerous PhD theses, and that was fabulous. A little way down that journey, I happened to be at the Wine Centre at a networking event, and I had a bounce in my step because we'd just got one of the devices working in the lab, and I was chatting to someone, and I said, we've just developed a dip sensor, a dip sensor for aluminium. And essentially what it was was an optical fibre about a hair thick that you could put in a solution, a liquid, what would happen is capillary action would suck the liquid up into the optical fibre and we could use the light to sense the aluminium in the solution, which was the first step to making a corrosion sensor. I was chatting to someone who turned out to be a wine scientist and he said, could you measure sulphur dioxide? And so a new relationship started that had us working with a number of the significant wineries in this state to develop smart bungs for wine barrels. Cue another function, another glass of wine. There's a theme here, isn't there? Uh, about a year later, and I said to some other person that I only knew very um, remotely, we've got the sulfur dioxide sensor working, but I've realised that our sensor makes a measurement with a volume of fluid that is less than the volume of liquid in a typical cell in the human body. That feels like cracking a walnut with a drill I wonder what we could do now we can sense something in a volume of fluid less than the cell in the human body. And one thing led to the other. And we're now sensing developing embryos in IVF incubators. 
Because what you might not know is that every cell in our body is in a dynamic medium, how it responds to that medium, so whether it's a cell in an incubator or whether it's something in your body, depends on its environment, it depends on a whole range of complex things. And most of our technology for understanding that requires us to take something out of its natural environment and put it in a lab where it might not do what it would have done anyway. So that then led to having devices that can go in situ into your body for looking at things like is the plaque that's inside my artery actually putting me at risk for a stroke? Or is it the harmless kind of plaque that apparently a large proportion of our 17 and 18 year olds already have and will never bother them? So some of these really profound questions could not be asked before we knew new ways to measure them. And so I hope that gives you a little glimpse into what makes me tick. So just in my kind of bus wind to where I am now. I spent 10 years building this up at the University of Adelaide. We got to around about 200 people doing things in this space of measurement, fundamental and applied. And I, I was ever so proud, and I'm still ever so proud of the culture we created. It was inclusive, it was fun, it was productive. But when you're a a bubble within a broader culture, it's not always easy as a single individual leader to have that same broader cultural effect across an organisation. And I have to say one thing that makes me super proud is that I, I went back just last week to the 10-year celebration of IPAS, which is the institute that I set up there at Adelaide, and that same feel is still there, that same culture is still there, people have stepped up in, and, and, and it's extraordinary. So what I thought I'd set about doing is seeing whether I could have a role in shaping an institution's culture and performance. And that's what I've spent nearly the last five years doing at the University of South Australia. For those who don't know, UniSA, it's a young, dynamic university. The research has been growing by 10% component annual growth every year for the last five years. In our culture, in an environment nationally of increasing competitiveness, it's a university that takes pride in doing research that's partnered with the communities and the industry who'll use the knowledge that's created. And that profoundly changes the nature of the questions the researchers ask. You'll even notice my language. I had to learn how to talk not just like a scientist, but how to work with people doing research in business, in humanities, social sciences as well. And my own view of the interdisciplinary or the transdisciplinary has now broadened to that broader canvas. I've very much enjoyed that. It's been an absolute privilege. I've stayed an active researcher throughout all of that, partly because I think you have to, because if you're going to lead researchers, and my role was responsible for all the research at the university, you can't do that without experiencing on a personal, visceral level the challenges both internally and in the broader ecosystem, um, but also just because it's escapism for me. <laughs> you know, like the number of times you spend a full day in face-to-face -face meetings and dealing with management conundrums or doing strategy. I'd go home, get the kids to bed. That's harder now. But anyway, get the kids to bed and I'd just sit down and find in my inbox that a PhD student had sent me a chapter of a thesis and I'd be lost for hours. I just love that immersion, that focus that doing science gives you. So now you've caught me at a turning point. I'm rarely this relaxed because I've been on leave for the last few weeks, apart from all the talks I'd agreed to give before I went on leave. <laughs> And um, I start next Tuesday as Australia's Chief Defence Scientist, running what's now called Defence Science Technology Group, used to be DSTO. What many people don't realise actually is that really it's a three-faceted role and that's what drew me to it. Yes, it's the CEO role for DST Group. It's also the Chief Defence Scientist is the person with primary responsibility for giving, being essentially a conduit for science and technology advice to government in the domain of defence. And in the current world we're in where rapid technology change really does have a material impact on our safety and national security, it's very important we have good people feeding in 
through that organisation. And the third aspect of the role is that it's a deputy secretary in the Department of Defence, so I'm now a public servant, something I'm still coming to grips with. <laughs> but that's me and that's where I'm at. Um, it's, I'd just like to, before I finish, just offer a huge thanks to everything Rotary does, the selfless work. As a um, person who got to benefit from that early exposure to science beyond school, through the National Youth Science Forum. I've seen the impact Rotary has. Um, I was chair of the National... Yay, go! <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, as the chair of the NYSF for a few board for a few years, I got a chance to play a hands-on role, and I still do everything I can to support it as its science patron. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure to share my story with you, and I hope I haven't interrupted your lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an inspiration. And um, you can just see the passion and enthusiasm in her voice. We have got some questions. Uh, John and then Steve. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, tell me, with, uh, uh, do you have private, the, the private sector involved in, in financing some of your research? And, and if you do, uh, can we avoid the situation where a lot of South Australian inventions over the years have, have been bought by, you know, the, the large pharmaceuticals and, and it leaves Australia. Is there any way of patenting and, and, and keeping it here? That's a really strong, powerful question and I'll just, I won't do it justice because of time, I'll touch on it. Uh, I have personally had a lot of benefit from private sector investment in my research through my own career, I've had 17 families of patents, so I'm very familiar with patenting. Um, and just to give you a flavour, at the University of South Australia, the $85 million of research that was brought in this year, two-thirds of that had an industry partner or a community partner. So it is significant in funding our research. The public-funded research has got relatively less over time and industry's contribution has grown. There's been a shift, though. There's been a really significant and very positive shift over the last three to five years, both in terms of universities understanding that their social licence depends on not just generating knowledge, but taking that knowledge and turning it into impact. And there's also been a bit of a wake-up call around entrepreneurship. It's not that long ago where... Scientists or engineers who have an entrepreneurial bent would be overtly discouraged from that. I might just put a caveat in there to say that um, many people who choose to become academics don't have that natural orientation and you can't... I think you're born an entrepreneur. I don't think you can make them. You can teach them and support them, but I don't think you become one. Um, so there's been a shift now, and UniSA was a uni that had it in its DNA from the start, but some of our more traditional universities are now waking up to the power of impact from research, and they're doing it through partnering with industry, and they're doing it through supporting entrepreneurs. We still have a way to go. Our biggest handicap is actually our industry mix. And look, just to put it very briefly, and I'll start by saying that we have some of the most extraordinary medical research in Australia, in many, many areas, but it's very sobering for me to think that 55% of Australia's research is health and medical, but it's about 5% of our industry. Damn right. And that is the heart of your problem that you've just expressed there. There's a number of different ways you'd start to remedy that. Um, one of the things I can do in my new role is to play a facilitation role in growing industry beyond um, defence science that actually then has broader application into other areas and help to turn some of these small entrepreneurial companies into bigger companies for South Australia and Australia. Thanks, Tanya. That was a fantastic address. Um, you touched on a couple of things that really resonate. One, professors brag, but I'll leave that. But my question is, uh, is more contemporary. The internet was created by scientists as a communication tool. 
But now we're at a, a point where that communication becomes potentially a threat and a weapon by people who don't have our best interests in mind. How are we going to manage this? And I mean, this is it's a ridiculous question, but I'd, I'd just be interested in your thoughts in terms of globally, how do we address this problem of communicating in, in a manner that we've never had at our disposal before, but it's so vulnerable and the, the, the benefits of what we're creating are so easily stolen? Mm. Again, another brilliant question that I can't do justice to in a brief reply, but just to say there's no question that the biggest threat we face, both as individuals, as a nation, as a society, is cyber security. It's actually quite sobering when you reflect on the origin of our current communication systems because you're spot on. It did come out of academics and their need to work with people around the globe. But what you'll find today is it's actually academic organisations that are most vulnerable and are at risk of cyber security breaches because of the way we tend to need to share and collaborate internationally and because of the value of that knowledge that is quite a soft target. I'd say, look, I'm a pragmatist at heart and I think one of the things we need to do a lot better is get more kids into these fields. I find it quite dispiriting that um, we're still so underdone in terms of kids studying some of these IT, computing science fields. It, it comes nowhere near matching the need that the industry has for people with that training. Layered on top of that is the diversity issue. We've gone backwards in terms of the numbers of young women studying in these fields since I was at university. And the jobs are there, they're high paid. I was in Sydney a few weeks ago talking to some senior recruitment executives saying that it's only their own moral compass that stops them trying to get the whole output of the universities at any one year in those specialisations to try and share them across the industry. So, you know, maybe that's something for discussion with Rotary. How can we encourage more kids to consider some of these careers? Because I think one of the problems we have is that too many people have such a gap in their knowledge about security that even if they're not security specialists, they can create problems in going about their business. I think we have run it. It's two o'clock and I'm getting the wind up. But Tanya, um, thank you so much and we wish you all the very best in your new role. We are very privileged that you've come to meet us today and I'd like to give you a Rotary Club of Adelaide pen so you can sign all those important documents in Canberra. <laughs> thank, <laughs> you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank can we all stand and thank Tanya? Thank you.